Yeah, okay, we are recording. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Ask Nature Spot. Um, we're going to go through some uh, recent observations from Leicestershire and Rutland that people have found. Um, we'd ask anyone um, uh, who's found anything interesting or anything they want to know about to submit all of their records from Leicestershire and Rutland via the Nature Spot website, and that's naturespot.org.uk. If you're not in Leicestershire or Rutland and you happen to be watching this, then could you please submit your records via iRecord at uh, this uh, address? So uh, that's the uh, introduction. Um, so I've, I've got some uh, um, observations that people have sent in in advance. Um, but I think uh, Jeffrey has something that he wanted to uh, uh, share. So um, do you want to go first, Jeffrey? Because I know you have to uh, leave early. Should be able to just share your screen. And you've got your microphone muted as well. Okay, there we are. Um, Steve Woodward uh, was out uh, recording in Galby, and he was in the church at Galby, and he found um, a melanchia, which is a genus of North American trees. And he noticed, he's got very keen eyesight, that it had uh, a fungus on it, a powdery mildew. So he asked me if I could have a look at it, and he asked me if I could have a look at it because he knew I'd recently acquired this enormous volume about powdery mildews. So I had a, I got the powdery mildew off and had a look at it under the microscope. So it's quite a, an attractive beast. Now all this come up oh dear. eventually. There we go. This is what a powdery mildew looks like. This is the, the sexual stage, and it's we're, called. We're still seeing your direct oh. review, Jeffrey. Okay, we're well, seeing a big photo. What do I need to do? Uh, if you open the photo and then share, share that one. Okay, I've, I've got to share. New share. This one. Yes. Okay, see that? So well, now we can see it. Okay, right. So this is um, a micrograph. This is the, the, the sexual stage of the powdery mildew, and it's called a chasmothecium. Now, um, it's quite an elaborate structure. The, the blob in the centre contains some um, the spore, sporing structures, and I'll show you those in a minute. But the outside has these rather lovely projections on it, which branch dichotomously at the end. Um, Here's another, here's another little micrograph of the um, Chasmothesa. And in this one, I've actually squashed them. And I squashed them so I can get the insides out. So we need to look at what the, the ASCI, ASCI, what, what the, the sexual structures inside look like. And here's one that's just coming out. This is the wall of the Chasmothesa. And these are the, the ASCI inside. The Anascus is um, a, a sexual structure of this uh, type of fungus. And this is a, a, another micrograph of the end of this projection. You can see how detailed they are, how, how dichotomously branched. And these are structures that are used in their uh, classification. The ascus itself is circular, more or less, and it has a, a fairly thick wall. And it has this region here, which is a, a thin region, and it's called the oculus. And the width of this is important in the um, determination of the species. It also has some spores in it. They're quite hard to see, but there's one here, two, three, four, five, six. There's actually eight in all. And here's another view of it. This is the oculus, and there's some spores inside. So, um, I had, uh, I had uh, I looked it up in the book, and I keyed it all out, and it didn't quite come out to what I would expect. Um, there is uh, a fungus called it's Podosphera, the genus, um, which has these single assi. And 
these uh, powdery mildews have got a very complicated taxonomic history. Um, one group, Podosphera macrospora, had, was thought to be plurivorous, that means it, it, it was existed on lots of different types of hosts, but recently it's been separated off. And the one in Amelanchia was called Podosphera amelanchiris. Now, this didn't quite key out to that because it had, didn't have enough of these projections. It should have about 12 to 15. And then when I was looking at, only had eight to 10. So in the end, I couldn't quite um, identify it. So what I, 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 we've decided to Steve, ask Steve if we send it off to an expert to find out whether it is Podosphera amelanchiris or whether it's Podosphera macrospora that has jumped from a, a host that is in Britain onto this, this plant and it's not quite well adapted yet. So that was, that was quite a little taxonomic puzzle. Um, but I thought it'd be quite interesting to show people because I don't think many people um, get to see these stages. You see them on leaves as a, a big sort of gray fungally web and occasionally you see little black dots in it. Well, that's what little black dots look like. And these, these structures here are very interesting and they're quite attractive. So um, I thought maybe we'd just like to see those for, for, for now. Um, and also the problems of, of actually taxon up, of identifying these. So even when you have this book, this enormous great big volume, you still can't quite get down to, to what, um, to, to a species. And you're sometimes left in a bit of a limbo. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Jeffrey. Um, we don't. Well, I mean, we don't get a lot of reports of things like uh, mildews. Um, we get a few rusts uh, reported, but obviously they're not the easiest fungi to identify. Um, so I take it this isn't an open call for everyone to send you every powdery mildew that they find anywhere in Leicestershire. Well, uh, I don't uh, mind because they can all sit in a pile, and I can do them in the winter. <laughs> that could be a full-time job, I would think. Uh, and a bit. Um, it, it's perhaps worth saying I've seen not so much from VC55, but I've seen a lot of reports of fungi in the last couple of weeks. I think uh, following the drought in the spring and then the rain that we've had more recently and cold nighttime temperatures, there's a lot of stuff starting to fruit. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of reports of wax caps around. So the seasons have just gone crazy basically but uh, it's well worth keeping your eyes open for fungi when you're out. If you, if you record fungi, uh, then uh, it's well worth looking. And if you don't record fungi, well, our next Ask Nature Spot session is on the 24th of August. So there you go, there's an opportunity for you. Uh, we can maybe give you some tips on doing it. We, we may try and run a, a session on fungi um, later in uh, the year. In, uh, well, I was, I was saving this for the autumn but maybe we better not save it too long because if they're starting to fruit already, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should uh, not leave it too long. Okay, thanks, uh, Jeffrey. Um, I'll share now some of the things that we've had sent in. Uh, and the first thing is from, hopefully you can see that. Uh, the first thing is from uh, Martin. Um, who found this plant in Stretton Wood. And uh, Martin, I think you've got Exhibit A with you this evening. Yes. <coughs> the plant had been knocked down by the time I went back to take a photograph of it, so I just picked up a few odds and ends. Did you, you, see? You, said, you said earlier it had been run over by a forestry vehicle. Well, it looks like it, yes. It was definitely... <laughs> First. At least it's coming to flower now, which is what I went to try and take the photograph of. It's about two centimetres across the flower. Uh, so I've got the big leaf, which has now got a powdery mildew on it. Oh. <laughs> so you I just you need confirmation that it is Jacobea aquaticus. You, I don't you think it, you not many records from over this way. No, I don't think we've got a, a, a record of this on Nature Spot as yet. Um, I, I think you had a look at this one, Sue, in advance, and you thought that that's what it was. Uh, I, I thought it was. Yes, the the that large terminal lobe to the leaflet is um, 
diagnostic, as far as I know. I mean, if Jeffrey, if I've got this wrong, let me know. But um, the other thing is looking at Martin's flowers. That they look a slightly more lemony, yellowy colour than um, than ragwort, and I always associate that with marsh ragwort as well. And, and I'm wrong about Nature Spot. I looked under the wrong name. I looked under Senecio, oh. and it's actually. Uh, it's one of these plants that has annoyingly, Stace, bless him, has changed the name um, to Jacobea aquatica. Uh, and I hadn't realised that um, that I'd got that wrong. So we do have records on Nature Spot. My, my mistake, I'm afraid. Um, but it, it does, um, it does um, bring to light how confusing it can be when species change their name, really. And they sometimes subtly change the... Um, uh, the, the um, what's it called in Latin? The sort of ending of words. I can't really re remember. Um, oh. So uh, it's my my fault. I'm sorry. We've got we have got records, and we it's it's not uncommon in in the county, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Uh, it's in Rutland. It's quite scarce in Rutland, I think. Yeah, it, I've never seen it outside of marshland or marshy meadows. Um, so uh, the site I think of it. At, uh, growing a lot in is um, Elson Meadows uh, and Everard's Meadows, which is just just down to the south in the Saw Valley. Um, but I'm sure it's in Lee Meadows as well, and some people other sites, uh, other sites along the Saw maybe Flood Meadows. I'm sure Jeffrey can add to that. No. I think it's declining. It's one of the declining marshland species. It, would that be um, nutrients that are um, wiping no, out? Just sites are drying out and they're being drained. It's not wet enough. Okay. Well, um, but nevertheless, Martin, it would be, we'd appreciate it if you could submit a record. Oh, well, um, but particularly if it's not common in in Rutland, um, because it should it should just pop up when you when you type the name uh, into um, uh, into Nature Spot. So uh, that should be that. So thank you for that one. That's a good one. Um, Dave, um, uh, is, is Dave with us this evening? No, Dave's not with us this evening. Yes, I am. Oh, you are. Yes. Right. <laughs> Have you got a camera? Do you wish to appear? Well, I, I, I thought I was. I don't know what the problem is. OK, well, um, Never mind, we can hear you, that's the main thing. Do you, would you like to uh, talk us through this one? Yeah, um, I found this plant last year in uh, uh, Tunnel Lane in Hatham, where there's an old scrapyard. And it's a bit of a hot spot for plants there. And I wonder whether, because of the activities of the scrapyard, the ground conditions outside are possibly limey. Um, and this was uh, very much a sprawling geranium. Um, and I wondered about rotundifolium because of its unnotched petals. Um, and there aren't many uh, small geraniums with unnotched, unnotched petals. But it didn't look anything like the pictures in my books. Um, very much a sprawling looking plant. Uh, but I did find a picture on Wildflowers of Ireland, which looked very similar. Um, and it reappeared this year, uh, but nothing like as much as there was last year, um, which gave me the opportunity to get a specimen and uh, send it to Geoffrey. And um, Geoffrey's confirmed that it is geranium rotundifolium. Um, and uh, I'm just repeating what Geoffrey said. Um, kidney shaped leaves divided to about half to the base. Pink flowers, small petals, rounded tip, reticulately rich seeds. And I think it should have red stalk glands, but I'm not sure they were apparent at all. So I'm um, quite pleased to find that one. Yes. Uh, thanks. Anyone um, want to add anything to that? Any of our botanists? Is it is it significant that it was on a, a building site? Uh, do we think? Yes, I think it is. Um, I, I, I did actually first find it in that same location in 
2008, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but didn't tell Mike G's because I didn't realize it was rare. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, I've found it since in Leicester City in two or three places and also along the Great Central Railway um, at Quorn and Rothley, where it grows amongst ballast there. I think it's, a, it's, it's an import. It's, it's a southern species and it's been working its way north, really. So I think we can find a lot more of it. The, it, the distinctive feature of a very, very bright red tip glands, which you can just about see on the, PT, uh, on the um, uh, flower stalk on the top right hand one just below the yeah up there just below the flower on the top left hand one this one just about visible yeah just there are more glands visible on the left on the uh, right hand one as well but they're they're quite bright and red um it, it's an unusual species um, as you say one of the things that should alert you to it in the field is the lack of the the notch in the tip, because the, the two other species that are similar, which is Fusillum and Molly, both have notch petals. So that's your the unnotched petal is the field character. Great, thanks. Um, I I was just looking at this leaf in in this bottom right photo. Is is that like a, a variegation on the leaf, or I, I couldn't decide if that could possibly be a leaf mine? It's not a variegation. It's it's some sort of damage. I, I don't know whether it's like surface damage. I know if a snail has chewed the surface, or if it's actually a mine. Something's come along and had a meal of it. It's not a leaf mine, Alan. I'm sure of it. Okay. Um, it, it's just surface damage to the leaf then. I couldn't, couldn't decide. I thought it might be another two for the price of one there for a minute. So, okay. You have got one of those strange little parasitized aphids in the, in the bottom, bottom right corner of that though. Down, this, down here, yeah. yeah I don't, what does that? I can't remember. Um, I imagine that would be an ichneumon, wouldn't it? Would be a wasp of some sort, probably. There's a lot of aphid parasites, um, mm. thousands and thousands of these unidentifiable ichneumons as we were <laughs> discussing just just yesterday yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, move on let's quickly move on so thanks dave thank you for sending that can we have a record please yes i've already put one in oh excellent thank you um i've got a gap sorry about that gap we've got we've had a record sent in from sussex um uh um i don't think russell or Nathalie are with us this evening um, but we've included this because uh, this is a species which uh, does occur in uh, Leicestershire and Rutland. Uh, small China Mark. Uh, Dave, you want to say anything about this one, Small China Mark? Not really. I think it's um, a, a particularly a wetland species. I don't think it, ha it turns up in garden traps so often. Um, I, I've not been doing so much mothing recently, so uh, I've not seen it this year, but I, I have recorded it in Leicestershire before. Okay, so it, uh, we, as I said, the reason we included this is because we, we know it occurs in the county. It's not a, not a Sussex uh, specialist. Um, and uh, the other one that they sent in, uh, keep your mic open, Dave, uh, was uh, this uh, hoverfly. Uh, Aristalis tenax, one of the big drone flies. So Dave, can you talk us through this one? You want to say something about key features for identifying this one? Sure. Uh, well, this is one of the kind of commonest uh, hoverflies that, that we see around. It doesn't actually look like a traditional hoverfly. Um, it, and as the name suggests, it does look more bee-like. It's quite chunky. There are two very similar species. This one, the common drone fly and the tapered drone fly both equally common, uh, the males of which uh, are more easily distinguished. You can tell this is a male by look at, if you look at the eyes, you see how the eyes kind of connect together, touch together in the, in the middle, and that tells you it's a male. The female eyes are more separated. And uh, so in the tapered drone fly, uh, as the name suggests, the abdomen is quite thin and tapered where it's, it's, it's more chunky in the common one. Uh, you can't really go um, on the markings on the abdomen um, 
I've seen them that are all black and some that have multiple orange spots. It's very variable. Um, the, the other key feature, if you've got a good enough photo and you can't see it in this one, is the color of the tarsus uh, or, or the tarsi on the front legs, uh, whether they're dark or pale. Uh, and I can't remember which way around it is. One's uh, got dark uh, tarsi and the other one's got pale tarsi. Uh, so if you take a, so, Sorry? Sorry, I just can say 10x is the one with dark tarsi and... Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Um, so yeah, if you, can, if you can kind of see the colour of its feet, or particularly its front feet, then uh, that's, that's one of the easiest um, characteristics. And that applies to both males and females, so you don't need to worry too much about looking for the, the or judging the shape of the abdomen. It's always a problem, isn't it, when you get these kind of comparative features. You know, one abdomen is you know, more tapered than the other. If you've got them side by side, it's fairly obvious. But uh, if you've only got one on its own, it's quite hard to know, you know, whether, is that tapered or is that not tapered? I mean, it's a little bit tapered, but um, yeah. So if you could see the feet, it would be, it would be a lot easier. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks for sending those in, uh, Russell and Natalie. Um, oh, it's a good time of year for um, hoverflies, of course, a lot around at the moment. One of the very common species that you'll see at the moment is the so-called marmalade hoverfly. If you, if you look uh, that up on the Nature Spot website, um, fairly easy to recognize species, quite a small hoverfly. Um, there are a lot around. Many of those will not be British. Many of those will be migrants. Uh, that have come from the, the continent. It never ceases to amaze me that a, a one centimeter long insect may have originated thousands of kilometers away and uh, come over to uh, Britain for its, for its holidays. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, there's, there's one more uh, that uh, we've got sent from Sussex. And again, <clears throat> I think you can find these in, um, the uh, in the county as well. Um, I wasn't sure when I looked at these. I, I was thinking woolly aphid when I looked at these. But Dave, you think it's a ladybird larva? I, I think so. Um, I've not seen one myself, um, but yeah, searching around, um, it, it does seem to match the the, the larva. There's there's quite a few interesting larva of ladybirds, and the kidney spot ladybird um, has all these spines on it. Um, but is is dark, and uh, so initially I wondered if it was like a white version of that. But um, I think it is another ladybird larva. Uh, the skinless ladybirds are some of these kind of cryptic uh, ladybirds. They're quite small. They're not uncommon, but they're not frequently recorded because they're quite small and they hide away. Um, but yeah, I looked up the uh, larva for 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 skinless, and uh, it, it does seem to match very well. The, uh, the guidance does say, though, that you cannot tell which skinless species it is just from the larva. But, uh, yeah, well, we certainly have skinless ladybirds in Leicestershire, so we must therefore have larva. So something to look out for. Well, the, as, as you say, the, the adult ladybirds, these, these small cryptic ladybirds, only a couple of millimetres long, uh, fairly actually quite common when you go looking for them but very seriously underreported yeah. so that the larvae must be 10 times or 100 times more underreported than the adults I would think so uh, it's a it's an interesting observation so they're actually doing your plants a favor they're not eating your plants they're um, they're almost certainly predating whatever that is that that is that is on your on your plants, they're probably chomping on the aphids or, or whatever they can find on, on the plants. Okay, uh, and we've also had one from uh, Christine uh, sent in this fly, this dance fly. At least I think it's a dance fly. Um, Christine, you, I think you're here. Do you want to um, say something about this one? Oh yes, hi. Um, there were loads of these, probably a swarm of about over 50. Um, in a garden in Leicestershire at the end of May and they've disappeared now but uh, as I say there were there were loads There's about 10 millimeters something like that in size from what I can remember um, 
they seem pretty harmless, but they just flew round and round and they just, yeah, they were constantly in the air. Yeah, I, I, I'll stick my neck out here. Um, I think this is um, Empis, uh, one of the dance flies. No, okay. it's not. No, no, it's not Empis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Ragio scolopaceus. <laughs> they have these this common name. I think is it the, the down looking flies. I'm not quite sure why they're called that. Maybe because they often perch upside down. Um, there's 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 a few uh, ragio species around. This is the commonest one, and it's mm -hmm. easy to identify because it has uh, the the patterning on the wings. Um, all of the others uh, have um, plain wings. And uh, as the name suggests, you, you do often find them perching on fences and, and fence posts or upside down. I've not seen them uh, in the last week or so, but prior to that, they were very common in, uh, well, in all sorts of places, meadows particularly. I don't know much about the, the life history of them, um, you know, how they breed, what they feed on, that kind of thing, but it is quite a common fly. Okay, they were next to a field. Yeah, I, I think they're probably predators from the size of them, but uh, I, I don't know for sure. Right. Harmless then? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Thank Unless you. you're a child, then it might eat you, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank, thanks for that, Christine. So, um, uh, uh, Ragio, um, uh, you, can, you can find that one. They, you, I think probably they're... they're It'd be hard to find at this time of year, as Dave said. Late spring, early summer, you, 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 they're, they're everywhere in the meadows, and then they tend to disappear. You might find sort of smaller numbers of them, but they, they tend to go a bit. Um, okay, um, Ed, um, I believe you've got a photo um, for um, to sh to share to just go back to what we were saying before. <laughs> Yeah, I think we'll we'll try this because we've uh, okay. let's go to photos and see if it'll come up. Um, I've only just moved it into the iPad, so let's see. Uh, sorry. Ah, uh, has it arrived in the? I moved it from the PC to the iPad and it had arrived on the phone's photos, if, but it doesn't if, seem to if, be. If you can open the photo first so that you can see the photo and then in Zoom, you should be able to share it. Yeah, it's not moved across onto the iPad, which I thought it should oh, have. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. It just showed the legs quite nicely. So. Uh... Okay, well, I think, yeah, sorry. That... Yeah. Thank, thanks for offering. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got some um, pictures on uh, the Nature Spot uh, website. Yeah, so you yeah, should, you should yeah. be able to see examples on on, on Nature Spot. The, of, the legs uh, are very clearly yellow and black as opposed to black, so it's, it's quite nice. Okay, thanks. Um, so I've just got a couple of my own. I'll do, and then I'll then I'll pass it over. Um, I've been unhappy this year, um, apart from lockdown. Uh, because the obvious thing to do in lockdown is to run a moth trap in the garden, um, hours of entertainment, except this year, no moths. Um, and there, there seems to be quite a split this year. There are, there are some people who regularly trap moths who seem to be saying, yeah, yeah, no problem, loads of moths. And, and the other half of the moth trappers are saying, no, no, no moths. Um, and the, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, but I think the consensus is that we had five months when most of the country was underwater. We had our wettest ever winter. We then had a, a, a drought in spring where the ground was baked hard like, like a brick. Um, and then uh, recently, the last time I ran the moth trap at the beginning of July, uh, it was actually set, I, I put a thermometer inside the moth trap overnight. It was seven degrees on July evening. So it's been cold, so there hasn't been much flying. But anyway, um, I put the moth trap out last Friday evening, nice cloudy night, uh, southwesterly breeze. And I had my best year, best night of the uh, year. Uh, found one of these white satin moth. This is a new one for me. Not had this one in the garden. Not a not a rare moth, but um, but but a new species that I haven't had before. Um, but what I wanted to actually talk about was not moths, 
um, but everything else. Um, what, what's been noticeable is that it's not just the lack of moths I've been getting in the moth trap. I haven't been getting all the flies, beetles, everything else that you normally get. The, the, the trap has been almost sterile. Well, thankfully that, uh, that changed on um, uh, Friday and I had the welcome, almost welcome return of Vespula vulgaris. So there were a bunch of wasps in the trap on Saturday morning, which I could have done without, but at least it was life. Uh, but there was lots of other good stuff in there and it's taken me about three days to sort out the rest of the good stuff. The moths were easy. So this is an interesting bug. Uh, Miridus quadrivirigatus. Sorry, I haven't said that before. Um, as you can see from the map, this is, um, this is not particularly commonly recorded um, in Leicestershire. Um, Graham Kalos recorded this a number of times. Um, um, looks like a lot of the other myriad bugs, not particularly easy to make out. You need to look at it quite carefully, but the, 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 the pattern of stripes here um, is quite um, notable. And you can see that there seems to be a cluster of this. It, it's found around the southeast. There's also a cluster in the middle of the country. So that's worth looking for. And like a lot of bugs, like a lot of myriad bugs, attracted to light. So worth looking out for these in your moth trap if you run a moth trap. Um, and then um, also um, this thing, one of the Sikelidae. Uh, uh, um, these bugs with, with rows of spines on their, the tibia of their hind leg. And uh, this one uh, took me a while. So these hoppers, um, there are lots and lots of these, um, not particularly easy to identify. The color tells you virtually nothing. If you look up the pictures of this species, the Asus Lanio on, um, uh, on Nature Spot, you'll see most of them are bright red because this species can be bright red, but this was this nice green with nice turquoise accessories, which uh, sort of attracted my attention, which I thought was quite nice. The problem then was uh, dissecting it, which took me a bit of work. Um, you have to look at the arrangement uh, of the, the vertex, the face quite carefully. Uh, you need to count the spines on the hind femur, so this species has three spines on the hind femur. And ultimately, as, as in a lot of these uh, three millimeter long bugs, you wind up dissecting them. And the bad news is there is you can only really do the males, the females you can't really identify. So this is the male genitalia. This one fortunately turned out to be a male and it's got this bifurcated, uh, I don't know what this is actually called, uh, it's not a penis. I don't know what they call it in, in bugs that, that I, I've not really caught up with a taxonomy of or the terminology for this group yet. But again, I think this is a very common species, um, but um, uh, not particularly commonly recorded um, because uh, they're very difficult to identify. As I said, the color doesn't tell you anything. Um, it's not particularly uh, patterned in any way, although the reticulation on the uh, pronotum is characteristic. Um, so you have, to, you have to, to work to identify these things. So Sue and I were having quite an interesting conversation yesterday about bugs um, and uh, why they might be under-recorded because these things are very, very common, particularly these hoppers of various kinds, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, um, and, and it's largely down to identification difficulties. So we might have a little chat about that in a minute and what we can do about it. The other thing that was in the moth trap um, were lots of, uh, lots of these uh, aquatic bugs. Now, um, we, we, I do have ponds in the garden. I've got two ponds in the garden, but on a nice, uh, a nice warm night, um, it's interesting to know that there is a rain of aquatic bugs from the sky. So these things fly as well as live in water. And, and, and these, these bugs also are very difficult to identify. I'm calling these bugs because that's what they are. Te the technical meaning of that meaning an insect with biting or sucking mouth parts. So these are all predatory on other insects. 
Um, and so these these swimmers, as you as you as we call them, you might see in a pond, but they also rain down out of the spot out of the sky as they're migrating when thing when when things are typical. And I had half a dozen of these in the moth trap, attracted to light. Um, uh, you count the stripes on the protonum of this. The furrow in the face of this uh, male is quite characteristic. But in this species, the other thing is you need to look at the claw on the hind leg. And in this species, the claw is entirely dark. But um, not, not, not the easiest thing to identify. I think now I've identified it once, I'll be, do better the next time. Uh, and also in the trap where quite a few of these, this is a bigger one. So this one is eight millimeters from the tip of its nose to the, the back of its uh, wings. And uh, this, this one is this one, Hesperocorixia lineae. Uh, and again, there are two or three really very similar species, really quite difficult to identify. Size is characteristic. Again, counting the number of lines on the pronotum uh, is useful. Uh, but the key one here, there is, uh, there is a very, very similar species. This, in this one, the pattern of lines goes all the way to the back, uh, the apex of the, the corium, as this part of the wing is called. In the other species, uh, the lines fade out and it has a kind of a pale patch. So uh, Dave Bentley, who was helping me identify these, was pointing out uh, the, the key features. If you happen to find one of these when pond dipping, you can see the pale patch on uh, the other species uh, it, it, while well, it's in the net. And this one, you can see the stripes going all the way to the back. And likewise, on the previous thing, you can see the black claws on the hind legs. So um, these are uh, uh, Corixia uh, bugs and related aquatic bugs, uh, very, very common, uh, very, very under-recorded, um, uh, we do have quite good historical records uh, from Leicestershire uh, and Rutland, but, but I think the, the number of records that we get submitted to Nature Spot is nothing like, it doesn't reflect the true abundance of these. But that's, that's true of bugs in general. I think bugs are really quite a seriously under-recorded uh, taxon. So um, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, if anyone has any ideas, maybe we should run a bug clinic sometime. Hi, Alan. Um, yeah, I think um, I, lo I love recording bugs and um, I think you've shown some quite difficult ones, but a lot are not difficult to do at all. There's a fantastic online resource uh, called British Bugs. And if you just Google that, superb photography they do lend themselves to photography because unlike a lot of insects they just sit there a lot of the time while you um you know faff around and get the focus right so it's worth um they are really nice if you're interested in photography um they're often quite reluctant to fly so i think that people who are looking for flying insects or are looking perhaps for insects on flowers or trees or whatever uh, may not find them um, I've had a lot of luck recently with using a sweet net um, because they are they they do live inside grass in in within the grass sward. Um, so if you just sort of brush that through um, the tall grass, you're likely to pick up loads of them. And of course, because they're reluctant to fly, they don't then escape from the net, which is also quite nice. Um, so I I think um, we probably could encourage more recording and. Um, Let's put together a little uh, package of how-to, really. Well, I, 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 it would be great to get more bug records submitted because they are so common. Mm. Um, I, I, I think what you've said about the mirrored bugs is, is true. They, they can be done from pattern and appearance. But I think there are other groups of bugs that are, that that that's uh, that, that are much more difficult to identify. Certainly, most of the aquatic bugs are not particularly easy to identify, um, and I think uh, most of the hoppers are not easy as well. The hoppers really can't generally be done by appearance. I mean, even the frog hopper we get a lot of problems with because it's so variable in appearance. If you look up the frog hopper page on Nature Spot. 
there is a marvelous panel that David Gould put together of, of you know, color variation in frog hoppers. And trying to pick that out as the same species is, is, is quite difficult, it's immensely variable. Um, they are um, important because they do spread plant diseases and, and plant viruses and, and fungi. Uh, and frog hopper is, is, is under some um, uh, um, uh, inch, uh, investigation now as being a vector for spreading and having got to this point, of course, I'm blanking on the name. What's the name of the disease that they're spreading? Um, help me out, someone. I don't know. I've read about it. This, this imported mm. plant disease that's spreading. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on it now. Um, hoppers, yeah, I mean, you'll find loads and loads of leaf hoppers anywhere you go. Beating vegetation, if you beat vegetation over a, over a white tray uh, or if you use a sweep net, um, huge numbers of them um, and um, in the winter when I'm well actually all times of year uh, when I'm vacuum sampling uh, for spiders uh, large numbers of ground bugs as well um, which are quite cryptically colored not to, they don't tend to be brightly colored like the plant bugs they're mostly brown hidden away and again most people don't see them so seriously underreported um, Can I share my screen, Alan? This mm, yeah, please do. Oh, sorry, I'm very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I've just I've just put these together very quickly. Um, so I found all of these um, through sweep netting in the last couple of weeks. So the the one in the top left is Asotropis gimophalii, which looks very like that um, mirrored bug that Alan shown that had gone in his moth trap, but is it's quite a different shape, although sort of very similar in its patterning. And I, I think it's a camouflage patterning to look like dried grass, actually. <clears throat> it looks like this may be the first record for our county that possibly reflects the fact that no one's looking. And I don't think you'd find it necessarily if you weren't sweet netting and really searching for it. Um, the, the, the one on the top, um, the top right is a little bug, that, a little leaf hopper that's really easy to identify. Um, this is Athisanus argentarius, which um, is heading northwards. It's one of those species that seems to be, with climate change, just moving out of the southeast and it's popping up here and there. And I think David Gould had found quite a lot on um, Everard's Meadow, I think, at the weekend. Um, and then the the bottom left is um, Miris Mermis muformis, um, and this is a, a, a really nice little bug with a, which has a lot of colour variation. Again, very few records for it, but it's probably quite common. And the last one is a tiny little bug. It's only a few millimetres long. It's very well camouflaged in greeny yellow. And once you get your eye in for it, there are thousands and thousands of them um, in, in meadows near me. Um, uh, you know, every sweep net was scooping up um, a couple of dozen. So, um, but but oddly enough, we hadn't got records on Nature Spot for it. So th there is a lot, I think, that that um, there's a lot of lovely insects that are quite easily found. And if you're if you're interested in first county records, then um, this is probably a good group to be looking at. I'll stop sharing now. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had, I think I've had three uh, county firsts mm. uh, in the last couple of years. Mm. And, and it, it's, it's partly because of under-recording um, and it's partly because an awful lot of species seem to be spreading northwestwards. If you look at the British Bugs website, which as you say is a fabulous uh, resource, um, although it's not so good on aquatic bugs, I have to say, um, but if you if you look that at them up, um, you will see that they will say, oh, found in the southeast, known in Surrey and places like that. Well, now they're in Leicestershire. There are so many species of bug that seem to be spreading north. They're one of the groups of insects that are very, very definitely on the move. So, yeah, worth keeping uh, an eye out for. OK, so I'm aware that time is going on. I know, Dave, you wanted to share some uh, observations as well. well. Just Yeah, just quickly. And actually, uh, it's another bug, uh, interestingly. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, 
So this was um, one that I found um, just the other day where in, a, in a damp meadow in, in Nolvescroft Valley. Uh, and it was kind of crawling around in the in the grasses. And um, it immediately struck me as uh, the familiar red-legged shield bug. Uh, and I took a few pictures and it wasn't until I got home and looked at the pictures and realized that it, it didn't look quite like the red-legged shield bug uh, because it has these very sharp uh, spines on it on its pronotum. And so it made me actually, uh, well, as soon as I saw that, I realized it was actually the spiked shield bug, which is much less common. Uh, so I was interested uh, because of my initial uh, confusion, just to kind of compare the two. The red leg shield uh, bug is very common and uh, you, you find it in gardens. Uh, it's, it's more of a kind of woodland uh, species as well. Um, but uh, there's actually become more in common really than there are differences. There are similar size, they're large insects, both are a similar kind of background color, this kind of reddy brown color. Uh, they've got very conspicuous red legs. And also both of them have this kind of pale tip to the scutellum, which stands out very clearly in the field. Um, and they have these kind of, like many shield bugs, these protruding kind of shoulders on the pronotum. But the shape of them, uh, of these shoulders, is very distinctive. Um, right. Kind of thorn-like uh, on the spike shield bug. Uh, and, and look, in fact, if you look very carefully, they're hooked. The tip is, has got a hook on, on the red leg shield bug. And then the other difference is where you find them. The spike shield bug um, is typically found in, in damp meadows, grassland meadows. Um, and for, for me, I have found it once before. I found it at Rutland Water. When I checked back, it was like 10 years ago. So it's only the second time I've ever seen this species. Um, but it, it was interesting that um, whilst we're talking about bugs, that probably the most accessible group of bugs are the shield bugs. They're, they're large, many of them are very common, but there's, there's a surprising number of different species. Again, if you go on the British Bugs website, um, I, there's, there's a surprising number, I think maybe 30 plus species. And we've not got them all recorded on Nature Sport, but we've got quite a few of them. Um, so it's kind of a good introduction, I think, to people that, that want to, to expand their recording. Um, you know, shield bugs is a, a, is a very easy and accessible place to start. And most of them are readily identifiable um, from a good photo. Of course, it, it's further complicated by the, uh, the, 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 the nymphs of the larval instars of them. Like many bugs, they have multiple uh, development stages, typically five in the shield bugs. And each uh, of these, they're called instars, each stage in their development uh, can look quite distinct. So for every species, if you want to kind of know them thoroughly, you've almost got to learn five or six different uh, shapes and color forms. Uh, but the adults are, are normally fairly easy to, to identify. So yeah, I was very pleased with this, this record. It's uh, maybe worth saying that the, the British Bugs website also has um, photos of most of the instars because they are quite different in colour from the, the adults very often. And, and perhaps the other thing to say about shield bugs is this is what uh, you will see on the internet uh, referred to in America as stink bugs. Uh, and if you want to know why, if you pick up something like a common green shield bug and handle it roughly, not too roughly, only, only slightly, just, just mildly irritate it, uh, you'll find out why they're called stink bugs. It'll take you several days to, to get the smell off your hands. So. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, has, anyone else, has anyone else got any observations they wanted to share or questions they wanted to ask? Good things to be looking out for in the next month. What should we be looking out for in the next month? Well, bugs, obviously. We should all look for bugs. Sue, you're muted, Sue. Right. Uh, the leaf mine season is starting, Alan, and um, well, it has been 
it hasn't really stopped. But there's a lot of leaf mines around at the moment, so um, it's worth having a look. Um, on um, on alder, alder is a good one to go for. Alder, birch, oak, hawthorn. Um, if you if you do find any, try and um, and find and, and look for the larvae as well, because a lot of those have got very distinctive uh, markings, and you need to see them. So, with with leaf mines, knowing the host plant is 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 generally uh, fairly important. Uh, you're absolutely right. I should have said that. Yes, knowing the host plant is uh, is critical. You, that's the way into all the keys. You need to start with the host, and then it'll uh, you, there'll be a number of options, and you can usually work through a key to um, to get down to close to your um, your insect. You may not be able to get fully to it. They're not just moths, are they? I mean, the sawflies make some very lovely leaf mines, um, and and a, a lot around at the moment as well. We've got a whole uh, leaf mine section on um, uh, on uh, Nature Spot because, as you say, um, the mind, mines can, can be caused by a number of different groups of insects. So um, we, we've not listed them by insect; we've listed them as as leaf mines. So yeah. Um, Alan, did you see any of mine? Can we? Okay. Oh yeah. Can you show us your uh, photo, Nicola? Yeah, I forgot. Sorry, Nick, I've forgotten you. Gonna... There's a few things. Depends on how much time you've got. So I'll okay. just. This is my first attempt at. It was, it was coming up, it was nearly there, and then... It is, I think, harder to share on an iPad than on a computer. Okay, here we go. Can you see that now? Yeah. So this is um, a, a water barrel, and this is the hoverfly, and it's going around the inside of the water barrel, laying its eggs. And I think it's the... Um, Oh, I thought I could work out how to, to get to the next picture. Um, can, can you swipe the photo? Yes. Is it the one, I think it's got the so-called Batman marking on its, on the back of its pernatum, if that helps identify it. And it's the female, isn't it? Because it's got the eyes apart. Yeah, I think, uh, um, this is uh, this. So um, uh, I, I think uh, can I maybe um, uh, share my screen briefly? Yep. Uh, just one second. Okay. So uh, this is Graham Kalos. Can you see this? This is Graham Kalos' photo of uh, Nature Spot. Uh, and, and as, as Nicola mentioned, this is called the Batman hoverfly. Uh, and I think you can see uh, the reason why. Uh, so uh, this was in your bat barrel laying its, laying its eggs. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, 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 Myothropa floria. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it's the time of year to see this hoverfly about now. Uh, it's it's a very brightly marked hoverfly, um, and you'll see it around um, decaying wood, where, uh, as you said, it, it lays its eggs. In the um, in the Atom Arboretum in Leicester, uh, earlier in, this spring, uh, there was a, there is a rotting tree stump, and there was a huge cloud of these flies around the tree stump, uh, laying their laying their eggs. So uh, the, the hoverflies lay their eggs in a variety of different uh, environments. Uh, many lay them in uh, wet soil, um, but um, uh, um, a, a lot lay them, uh, some lay them in water, um, but, but rotting wood and hollows in trees and places like that 
are particularly common uh, sites for um, egg deposition. So I think this hoverfly is another very good group of insects for people who like sort of collecting things, seeing how many different things they can do. Shield bugs is a good one. Hoverflies are another good and popular group of uh, insects to um, record. Probably not quite as easy to photograph as shield bugs. Um, and like all groups of insects, very important to get the right angles when you photograph them. So from a hoverfly, it's always, always good to get a dorsal uh, view looking down on the insect. Quite useful to have a side view of hoverflies as well. And if you can, um, face on so you can see the face of the fly. Um, but always, if you've got the option, always take the face photograph last because that's the one that's likely to uh, scare it away. So it'll fly off before you can take your photo. Okay. Another one. So you're muted, Nicola, at the moment. Sorry. Uh, can you see the hoverfly? Yeah, we can see it. So that's an, um, another male hoverfly on box. And that's another view showing the legs, but I haven't got a face view. And obviously with that one, the wings are closed. These are just iPhone photos, so they're not great. Anyone want to have a go at identifying this? Dave, you want to have a go at this one? Uh, I think it's the uh, the pied hoverfly, Scivia pyrastri. Um, it's fairly large uh, and relatively easy to identify um, with the kind of white hockey stick markings on, on the abdomen. Mm -hmm. And then that's a female, is it? It is, I think, yeah. Uh, That's a bramble flower. Are we looking at the uh, looking at the one on the bramble flower? I I think this is a male. I think the eyes are. I think I think if this is a male, is it Dave? The eyes are nearly touching. Um, I see quite a few where they're nearly touching, but I take them to be male if they're really touching. If you see what I mean. Yeah, that, that's not clear. I I guess that was a female, but. Uh, it's hard to say on that one, I think. Uh -huh. yeah, also, if, if you look at the tip of the abdomen, the females, because uh, they're, they're obviously egg laying, if, if they're mature, um, they, uh, the, the abdomen comes tapers to a tip and sometimes the abdomen gets very long and, and tapering. Um, and this one is actually quite blunt, which would suggest it, it may well be a male. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this, um, this isn't the pied hoverfly though, is it? This is a different one. No, this, not, this, different no, this one. is different, yeah. It's a different part of the garden. It, this isn't um, Elegans, is it? Um, it's um, it's a, surf, a surfid. I think that's probably the best you can do from the photo. The, there's an awful lot of hoverflies that look just like this. Yeah. And, um, so that, that a lot of them turn out to be surface ribesi, um, but you really do, if it's a female, need to be able to see the legs. I think it's a hind female, I can't remember, um, uh -huh. all yellow. But, but um, if you, if you ha can't see that, then it, it could be one of the other surface or um, a Paris surface, I think. Yeah, uh, I've, got, I've got quite a lot of other photos, so I can look at different ones, um, but it helps me to narrow it down if I know what um genus i'm looking at and well, this is uh, gone yeah uh, uh, alan mentioned a sideways photo and that that's quite useful yes, for most of them i try and get i try and get top yeah. side and front but even so it can be very difficult and i think you have to accept with some of these um other flies that you can't really do it from a photo and you yep. you need to look microscopically at them um to be sure I think surface is probably one of, one of the most difficult uh, genera to identify. And, and the other one that's quite common is the, um, uh, the, the long bodied hoverfly as well. That, that, those can be quite difficult. Again, I don't think you can identify the females of those at all. Uh, uh -huh. The males that can be identified. So, Just, just the one male, the, the, the very, very long parallel sided one. 
uh, the, the females and the other males you, you can't do. Yeah. I don't think you can do the females anyway, <laughs> not even mm. if you're a massive expert. So this is on an ivy leaf, this is a male hoverfly. This is the same one that was in your water barrel, Mythropa uh, floria. Is it? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so the, also... the, the Batman marking on the, uh, uh, on the thorax isn't always uh, very obvious. Right. It does, it does have this kind of black and pale uh, blobs on, on the thorax. That's fairly typical. But it's yeah. not always a conspicuous mark. Oh. Well, while we don't encourage uh, the use of made up names, I've also heard that one called the teddy bear hoverfly as well. <laughs> it does have this kind of furry. I must admit, I use that when I'm out in the field because it's got that furry appearance, that, that sort of fuzzy furry appearance that, uh, you know, uh, I think just helps you remember sometimes. Well, yes, I, I noticed that one as being fuzzy. Um, anybody like caterpillars? We like them. We may not be able to identify them. <laughs> oh. Moves very fast when it decides to go and seems to like hiding underneath a leaf. Um, but that, I just couldn't get a front view. I, I don't think we've got our, our big caterpillar expert with us this evening, really. I don't know if we can if we can do. This. I would say almost certainly this is a moth caterpillar, uh, uh -huh. not a butterfly caterpillar. I don't think it's definitely a moth. I yeah, think. Uh, this is only, it was only this afternoon, so I haven't attempted to look it up yet. Uh, yeah, again, starting point could be the caterpillar section of the. There's a whole caterpillar section on the Nature Spot website, so you yep. might look through there and see whether you can. Uh, you, you can identify, I mean, that looks to be quite a characteristic one. You should mm. be able to identify that, but I, I, I'm not all that strong on caterpillars, I'm afraid. I think it might be in the sort of muslin moth or um, tiger or um, performing that sort of area to look at, but uh, I'm not that sure. I've got, um, I've got this um, great field guide to caterpillars. Oh, it's come up backwards on the screen. How do I do that? I don't know. It, it um, looks okay to us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's it's quite helpful, but I think they're quite hard to do, actually. You said about fungi earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, my attention was drawn to this one by this fellow. Very good. And when I looked to see what he'd been eating, that's what I uncovered. Tricky one. Well, it, <laughs> it's, it's a belete, but I don't know which one. No. I mean, I, I know fungi are quite difficult to uh, identify without microscopy, aren't they? If, if you look, well, they vary, but uh, if you look at the underside of the fungi, you should see that there's lots of tiny, it doesn't, well, it doesn't have gills like uh, edible mushrooms from the supermarket. It yep. should have lots of tiny pores on the underside and a kind of a spongy structure. Yeah. And then it's always worth, when you get that far, it's always worth uh, pressing your fingernail into it gently and seeing whether it changes colour, seeing if it changes, if, if it stains. Some of them, when, when you damage the flesh and expose it to oxygen, uh, they stain blue quite rapidly. That, that's quite a characteristic. Uh, the right. underside or the upper side, Alan? Uh, any, anywhere, just, just break it, just take the outer skin off and just, just, just to break a tiny corner off without mm -hmm. touching it too much and, and see if it goes blue. That's always okay. worth noting. And, and with, with all fungi, um, it's always worth, if you've got a piece, uh, it's always worth smelling it because if you look in the books, uh, a lot of them have characteristic smells. Don't, however, taste them, okay? Mm -hmm. But you can safely smell them as long as they don't go in your mouth. That's the main thing. Yeah, so I'm a bit cautious sometimes about touching them because you're not quite sure um, I, I think as long as you wash your hands afterwards, you'll 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 be fine. I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about touching them. Don't don't you know? Make sure you wash your hands before you eat your sandwiches. But uh, uh, you'll be fine just with touching them. But but certainly wash your hands. If if you go out with the fungi study group, um, they they do taste them uh, all the time. That's a, a key diagnostic factor 
um, you know, the taste. And in, indeed, many of the guidebooks um, tell, you know, give, give the taste, you know, it's got a peppery taste or it, uh, some other taste. So uh, you know, people like, you know, Richard Eilif and Tom Herring, they, they're very adept at having a little nibble uh, tasting it on the front of their tongue and then spitting it out. <laughs> but, they, but they've also got the advantage of knowing which ones the highly poisonous ones are. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we are not recommending tasting unknown wild fungi. The, uh, if you look up some of the books, actually, some of the highly poisonous ones, you'll see in the description things like it has a nice mushroomy taste. You know, and, 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 and the other the other thing that comes up a lot is uh, someone will post a picture of fungus online and say, is it edible? To which the answer is yes, everything is once. edible once. <laughs> uh, last few. This is on a pepper plant in the greenhouse and you can see the uh, has been aphids. My question is, is that a hoverfly larva on the leaf? Yes, it is, I think. It is a hoverfly larva, yeah. It may well be a surface larva as well, but I'm, I'm not an expert on these. Mm -hmm. I did I did once try and rear some of these, uh, and they did that. They, they were I know they were surfid larvae because I I saw the adult uh, laying eggs on the plant, um, but unfortunately when I reared mine. Um, all I got out of it. Would, for, so I think it's probably impossible to identify the larvae for to species level. No, um, it was just to, to get an idea of whether that was a hoverfly larva. But what, yeah. but what you can do generally is pick the leaf and pop it in a pot and then wait for it to pupate and wait for the adult to emerge. Um, but the last time I tried doing that with surfid larvae, all I got was parasitic ignimons, <laughs> which are now in the Natural History Museum. So, oh, right. so if you pick the leaf, does it need anything else? I mean, is that going to be enough for it until it's ready to pupate? I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but generally... Well, it's not eating the leaf, it's, it's, uh, they're carnivorous, it's eating the aphids. Yeah, but... but That's what I mean, if it, if it doesn't have aphids to eat, it, it's, it's going to be hungry, isn't it? It is, but at a fairly late stage like this, um, it, 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 if it's got enough resource built up, it will probably pupate. Um, I tend to pop a little bit of um, uh, uh, paper, uh, tissue paper in the, uh, in the pot um, to um, uh, just keep it slightly moist so it doesn't desiccate. Um, uh -huh. but, but make sure you don't get condensation. So put some gauze and an elastic band or a uh, kitchen towel and an elastic band over the top so it doesn't get condensation, don't seal it up because it will go mouldy otherwise. If, 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 if it's had enough to eat, it will be able to pupate and the adult will emerge and that will tell you what species it is. I think identifying them from the larvae is yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty hard. Do, what sort of temperature do they need to be kept at? Because uh, as I say at the moment, that one's inhabiting the greenhouse. Co co well, coolish, but the same temperature as it is outdoors. Okay. Basically. Just put it somewhere cool. That's just a cute young robin. Yeah. Um, my question is, is this a bee, wasp, ant or hoverfly? Neither. It's uh, one of this uh, uh, septis uh, species. I can't remember what the common name is, but um, they, they you, you what, what quite group? often they, they, they move around with their wings all flicking away and they often kind of like trace patterns on, on leaves. So what, what sort of creature is it? It's so a fly. It's a fly. Well, yeah. Dictum okay. fly. Uh -huh. And I think it's it's in the fly family uh sep septis septidae or sepsidae, is it? Sepsidae, I think. Sepsidae, yeah. 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 Can I can I just share my screen a minute, um uh um Nicola? Here we go. So this is, uh, this is the nature spot entry for sepsis fulgens. This is one of the commonest uh, species. Uh, but having said that, you'll see we've got very few records in Leicestershire and Rutland. Uh, this, this is, I see we've got down as an ant mimic. Uh, it's trying to pretend it's an ant. So right. your, yours does look very like this. However, I would point out that this is one of our red camera species. Yes. These, these are very, very difficult to identify 
and probably need microscopic examination. And there are there are quite a lot of uh, different species. Enzyme flies, there we go, we've called them. If, if I scroll through this, you can see there are there are quite a lot of difference. And, and frankly, they all they all look and there, there are a lot more than this. And they all look pretty, pretty similar. They are quite common. Uh, but but again, they're, they're all red camera because they're all pretty much impossible to identify from uh, photos. But I think we can be confident in saying that it's, it's almost certainly sepsis. Thank you. You skipped over your um, your vowel that you were saying draw your attention to the, um, to, to yes. the fungus. I think yep. it was a, a bank vowel. All right. Okay. Uh, did anyone else want to share anything this evening? Okay, so we, we've been going for um, uh, uh, over an hour. We should probably not prolong this uh, too long. Um, I, I think we'll start wrapping it up now. Thanks to everyone for um, uh, joining us this evening. Um, uh, I think we've set you quite a lot of homework to do over the course of the next month. So there are, there are shield bugs uh, and other sorts of bugs. There are leaf mines, uh, fungi, um, plenty of things that can be shared over, uh, so that's what we'll be looking at for in August. Uh, one more, Nicola? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, most of my aquatic features are inadvertent aquatic features. So this is the, the base of a water barrel upside down that collects rainwater off the greenhouse. Um, and I wondered what makes these little tubular surfaces in the silt at the bottom. Uh, well, it's um, it, it it's a fly larvae, um, right. of, of some sort. And uh, is it similar to the one on the side of the of the container? Um, no, it's it's it, I, I, this isn't a hoverfly. I I think this. No, is no, no. Where... I didn't mean, didn't mean it's a different container. Is right. it the one that's? Um... I can't. I sorry. I don't know how to use the pointer. Do I? I don't know how you do that on an iPad. Uh. <laughs> Is that one different from ah these? Uh, no, I think those are just two two mud tubes that it that that it's made. I think this is likely to be a chironomid uh, midge larvae, um, uh, right. uh, aquatic uh, larvae. These are these non-biting midges, the males having feathery antennae. Uh, but again, even the adult chironomids, very difficult to identify to species level. And I think, again, the larvae, pr basically impossible. Um, so so how do you spell chironomid? Is it PT? C-H, uh, looks it up briefly, C-H-I-R-O-N-O-M-I-D. Chironomidae, non-biting midges, I suspect. Okay. Thank you. There's, there's a possibility it could be something else, but they're, they're very common, these chironomid larvae. Well, I know I've got several different kinds of midge larvae in the water, so... Yeah, yeah unless anybody thinks it's something else. They are um, very often in one of those tubes, you'll find what fishermen call bloodworms. Um, and they, they have nothing to do, they are bright red, but they have nothing to do with blood. It, but they do have um, an iron containing oxygen carrying pigment to allow them to survive in really quite stagnant water. Um, so um, uh, the fishermen use them for bait for very small fish. So there we go. Okay, well, thanks everyone. So. Um, Pictures, please, next month of hoverflies, leaf mines, shield bugs, anything else that turns up in your moth trap that isn't a moth, even moths if you must. Um, but thank you uh, very much for joining us this evening. Uh, I hope that it was useful uh, and uh, thank you. <laughs>